belong. And if the enemy is telling you you don't belong, it's because you do belong. If he is saying you're not going to make a difference, it's because you will make a difference. If he is saying you are not anointed by the Holy One, it's because you are anointed by the Holy One. You belong to a company of women. You belong to a household of faith. You belong to the eternal realm. This world is not your home. You belong to heaven. Matthew 10, verses 26 to 28 says, don't be intimidated. Eventually, everything is going to be out in the open, and everyone will know how things really are. So don't hesitate to go public now. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There is nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. Save your fear for God, who holds your entire life, body and soul, in his hands. Do you understand that you and I are writing a chapter, writing a sentence, writing a song, writing a paragraph, that you and I are writing the end of the book of Acts? You know, Paul said to King Theopolis, he said, I wrote you what Jesus Christ began to do and teach. And in the last days, the daughters come alongside the men. And there is visions and dreams and there is signs and wonders and there is young and old. And you and I have been chosen for this moment in time. So I need you to not be intimidated because intimidation will come to silence your voice. It will come to contain your gift. I've had the privilege of traveling up and down the East Coast and being in front of a lot of young people over the last month. And here is what I found as a common denominator. These young people know, they know that the hand of God is on their life for something significant, something new, something God-breathed. But they have absolutely no idea what that something is. And I want to say to you what I say to them. I believe you don't know what you are called to do because you are called to do something that has never been done before. And so you must stop looking around and side to side and looking back and begin to lift your voice and lift your eyes because God is doing a new thing. And you will never discover the new thing by studying the old thing because a religious spirit will defend what God did while it fights what he is doing. And God is doing a new thing. He is pouring out his spirit on sons and daughters, old and young. I just expected to be part of the young category when it happened, and now I'm actually part of the old category. So here's the deal. I need you to create sacred space in your life. I need you to pause. I need you to ponder. I need you to open up your Bible like Lisa talked about and understand that it is alive that it is the wisdom of the ages. It is ageless. We are not going to bow our knee to our experience. We are not going to bow our knee to the opinions of others. We are not going to bow our knee to the culture. We are going to worship God, and when I worship God, I bow the knee of my opinion, and I do not reinterpret what he declares as an everlasting truth. We are going to be people who honor God with every area of our life. But when I step back, and I have sacred space, and I pause, and I ponder, I think, what in the world is going on? Do you feel that way at all in Texas? Okay, and God's like, I'm so glad that you're asking what's going on, because I have the answer for you. In Romans chapter 1, verse 21, it says, what happened was this. People knew God perfectly well, but when they didn't treat him like God, refusing to worship him, They trivialized themselves into silliness and confusion till there was neither sense nor direction left in their lives. They pretended to know it all, but they were illiterate regarding life. Our culture absorbs ceaseless amounts of information, and yet we lack tangible, measurable transformation. Families are broken. Marriages are fractured. Our judicial system corrupted. Teachers are hindered from being able to educate. Evil is called good. Good is called evil. Lies are broadcast as truth. 
Leaders are falling, children are afraid, women are violated, people are compromising their faith and losing their integrity. And as if we don't have enough information that perhaps, perhaps we're just a little bit off course, we keep gathering more data. But I would say to you that when people choose to willfully leave paths of light to pursue the recesses of darkness, they're often too smart to find their way back home. And then it says in Romans 1, 26, worse followed, refusing to know God, they soon didn't know how to be human either. Women didn't know how to be women, and men didn't know how to be men. But we gather today because we are not of those who refuse to know God. You are here on a Saturday because you understand that worshiping God makes me more fully human and that gender actually captures the image of God. We need women to be women and we need men to be men. And anytime you attack gender, you undermine the image and expression of God. And here's the thing. I can never know what I am called to do if I don't know whose I am. And if I don't know whose I am, I can't know who I am. And if I don't know who I am, I can't know what I'm called to do. I don't know where I'm heading. You know, there are some people that do jet lag well. I am not one of those. My husband's like, I just pray, and I say the scripture, you give your beloved sleep. That is not working for me. I tried to work <laughs> with him on that when we were in South Korea, and I came home, and I fell asleep eight pages later of the letter T. I woke up, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is useless for me to even be trying to edit right now. I'm just going to go take a nap. And I was just falling asleep when I heard the Holy Spirit say, I do not love my children equally. I sat up. I was like, did I bring home a blasphemous spirit from South Korea? God, you have to love us all exactly the same, or it wouldn't be fair. He said, same implies that one of you are replaceable. He said, equal implies my love could be measured. He said, I don't love my children equally. I love them uniquely. And see, God knows how much I love words. I have a confession. I do play computer games. It's not Candy Crush. I go to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, and I love to match words with their meanings. You can do it, and you can get all of them right, but it's not about how fast you, it's about how fast you get them right. You probably have seen my initials, LTB, because I've won a couple times. Anyway, it's, it's what I do when I'm procrastinating. But anyway, God knew that I would pay attention to a word. So I jumped up, looked up the meaning of the word unique. First tier definition is soul, representative of. There is no one who has ever been created to represent God's love to this earth the way you were created to represent his love to this earth. Number two, prototype. He did not mass produce after you. There is only one you. You are the beginning and the end of you. And then the third one, without rival, which is my absolute favorite. There is no competition for your place at the table. There is no competition for your place in his heart. There is nobody that can displace you. You are a daughter without rival, and that would stand to reason because we have a God who is without rival. One of the basic tenets of the Hebrew faith is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. He didn't take first place in a God competition. He is one. He is all. He is first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. He's the God that ends something, then begins it. And you or I are writing the end of our story, but you are here today because he had already written you here today. You are part of this time, and you are part of this moment. And Propel isn't about you coming and watching everybody else do something it's about setting something that is inside you, in motion, validating that you know what God has on you is valid, that it is necessary, that it is important. 1 John 2, 20, 21 says, but you belong. The Holy One anointed you, and you all know it. I haven't been writing this to tell you something you don't know, but to confirm the truth you do know, and to remind you that the truth doesn't 
breed lies. I remember the morning after I got born again. I was 21 years of age when I heard the gospel for the very first time. Went back to my college dorm room, spent about an hour and a half looking for the book of Paul because John had said, Paul said this, and Paul said that. And I was like, there must be some book of Paul. I took my, my new way or New Testament thing, of like one way or whatever, and I was like, please open to the book of Paul. And it opened up to Corinthians where it says, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. I was like, I found the book of Paul. I found the book of Paul. I was so excited. And I got up the next morning, and I felt like I should go tell my mom that I had gotten born again. And I was getting dressed when I heard something I'd never heard before. I heard, you're not a Christian. You're not a Christian. Nothing happened different in your life last night. Your family is too dark. You've been too bad. Nothing shifted for you. And I'm just going to tell you, I, I froze for a moment. And then I thought, wait, for 21 years, I've gotten up every single morning, and I've never once heard, you're not a Christian. I must be hearing now that I'm not a Christian because I am a Christian. So here's what I want to say to you. You belong. And if the enemy is telling you you don't belong, it's because you do belong. If he is saying you're not going to make a difference, it's because you will make a difference. If he is saying you are not anointed by the Holy One, it's because you are anointed by the Holy One. You belong to a company of women. You belong to a household of faith. You belong to the eternal realm. This world is not your home. You belong to heaven. So, what do we do with this fact that we belong? What do we do with this truth? Well, first of all, we war with it. We war with it because I would love to tell you that you're going to get up tomorrow morning and all you're going to hear is good things, but the enemy will come to steal. He will. And here's the truth. He's not, he's not attacking you based on your history. He's attacking you based on your destiny. He is after your future. He really doesn't care about your past, but he does want to shoot down and annihilate your future. So what are we going to do? Well, first and foremost, we're going to remember the things that we had imparted to us during this conference. 2 Corinthians 6, one says, companions, companions, front to the back, side to the side, companions as we are in this work with you. We beg you, please don't squander one bit of this marvelous life God has given us. God reminds us, I heard your call in the nick of time. The day you needed me, I was there to help. Well, now is the right time to listen, the day to be helped. Don't put it off. Don't frustrate God's work by showing up late, throwing a question mark over everything we're doing. Our work as God's servants gets validated or not in the details. People are watching us as we stay at our posts unswervingly. I'm old enough to know this truth, that there are a lot of battles you win by just standing. You end up outlasting your opponents, and having done all to stand, you stand, therefore, alert and unswervingly. I had the privilege of getting saved in 1981, which means I went through a decade or two of weird. Uh, Beth asked me one time if I'd ever taken a lap around the building. I was like, no, praise God, I was nursing babies, so I didn't have to do that. But there was a lot of unusual things going on in the church during the time. People were falling, people were laughing, people were shaking, gold dust, feathers, whatever. I didn't get to see either of those. I probably would have collected the gold dust. But anyway, there was all this different stuff going on. But here's what, here's what I did love about that time. We would stand for three or four hours of crazy services for five minutes in the presence of God. And when we would experience the presence of God, we didn't leave it in the building. We put it like a coal in our heart. And we took it home. And we said, if there is anything displeasing to you or to your presence, anything that would grieve your Holy Spirit, I want your presence more than I want compromise. See, Jesus was compromised so that we could be consecrated. And it isn't a legalism thing, it's a love thing. We're holy people because he is a holy God. But we need the Holy Spirit to show us how to separate the precious from the vile in our lives. And we would take it like a coal in our heart, and then we would fan it into a flame. I believe that Propel 
It's depositing a coal into your heart. And what you do with that coal is your stewardship. You can go home, you can be like, I'm gonna sign up for the next Propel, I loved having that coal. Or you can take responsibility. You can become part of a chapter. You can come into the house of God and say, I'm gonna make a difference, I'm gonna do something. And your actions are going to begin to fan what has already been seeded in your heart into a flame. Now I'm gonna tell an embarrassing story about me because I am usually the provider of all of my embarrassing stories. But I, uh, I, my husband and I have a privilege of doing a lot of work in the Middle East. We, at the end of this year, will have given away 10 million individual resources to people who cannot get a hold of it because of persecution or poverty. And one of the areas, yeah, and, and we're like, that's because of our partners, to be honest with you. One of the areas where we do really uh, intensive work is the Arabic-speaking communities. And I was in Colorado Springs driving on my way, can I just be honest with you, to get microdermabrasion. This is Dallas, you all celebrate that, right? Okay, so like you can only imagine with all of my travel that they just, you know, my girl just contacts me. She's like, you need to come in. You need to come in and I need to scrape your face off. You're looking really bad in your pictures. And so anyway, I was like in my car getting ready to get microdermabrasion when I got a phone call. And I found out this beautiful man named Etik who was responsible for getting our materials out to the Arabic-speaking people in the Middle East had been killed by ISIS. And I don't know if you've ever had a moment where your little shallow American world collides with martyrdom. And I sat in my car and I grabbed a hold of the steering wheel where they're telling me the details and asking me if I could talk to his widow and maybe write her a letter and I'm like, Yes, of course, and then I hung up the phone and I began to panic. I began to say, I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't, what do you say, thank you? No, that's awful, I can't say that. What am I gonna say? And I be, began to like grab a hold of the wheel and I thought, I need to talk to an older woman. I need to talk to her, I'm calling Joyce Meyer. I'm calling Joyce, Joyce don't know what to say. And, and the Holy Spirit said, stop it. You are an older woman and you need to stop. You need to stop putting question marks where I need you to put some periods and exclamation marks. I need you to make his life count for something and not make it about a comparison with you, but begin to honor his sacrifice. And so, you know, I called my guy and I said, okay, I've calmed down now, I've calmed down. Rob, what do I say? I don't even know what to say. And he said, Lisa, some give much and others give all. And here is the stance that we need to have, whether it be much or whether it be all, we are all in. We are all in. This is not a game we are playing. We are all in, all in. Galatians 5, 25 says, since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implication in every detail, there it is again, of our lives. That means we will not compare ourselves with each other as if one of us were better and another worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives. Each of us is an original. You have far more interesting things to do with your life that compare yourself with random strangers on the internet. You have far more interesting things to do with your life, and the truth is, you know it. You know it, you wouldn't be here if you didn't know it, because this is a conference that's gonna put a little bit of pressure on you to take what is in you and begin to multiply it. When we are faithful servants, we multiply, we don't bury, we let God unearth it and we begin to multiply what is on our lives. We don't need you to be another Christine Kane or Beth Moore. We need you to be your original. We need you to be that daughter without rival. We need you to find out what is buried inside of you and discover who you really are in the presence of God. You know, we've all had names. 
that have been put on us, called, things that were labels that would try to limit us. I grew up hearing one eye, Cyclops. I had those kind of labels on me because I lost my right eye to cancer when I was five. I never imagined doing what I am doing right now. This would have made me vomit and have diarrhea at the same time <laughs> if somebody would have said that I had to ever be up in front of more than two people. I would have just, I would have just gone, over, I would have gone over the cliff. But he, here's the thing. Here's the thing. God anoints the areas in your life where you are weak so he can show himself strong. He's not interested in you being like, well, God, you should just anoint this area because I'm already so amazing in this area. He's like, you know, you just go ahead and work with the pride in that area. And I'm going to actually take that broken place that I can take and I can multiply and I can anoint it so that I get the glory instead of you getting the glory. And I married a man who has never let me be comfortable with limits. When John became a youth pastor, he said, do you see all these young girls? I'm like, yeah. He'd say, they need your voice. And I'm like, I'm not some package deal. Just because you're the youth pastor doesn't mean I'm talking to those girls. And he'd be like, well, you need to be ready tonight. I'm going to call on you. I said, well, you just need to be ready. I'm going to walk out of the back of the building. And he's like, Lisa, I'm serious. You need to be ready. I'm like, you need to be ready. And so anyway, two Italians married is crazy. Anyway, so I would slip into the back and John would be like, hey, Lisa, come on up here. And he would like shove a microphone in my face, make me speak for the love of the girls. The Holy Spirit would be like, okay, she has nothing to say, but I'll just fill her mouth because I love my girls. And then he would, you know, then I would like sit back down. I'd be shaking for like an hour afterwards. Then I would get in the car with my husband and say, don't you ever pull a stunt like that on me again. I mean it, John Bevere, don't you do that. And I said, this is not right. I am handicapped. I have one eye. I am not getting up in front of people. Don't you make me uncomfortable. And John would say, you know, it's not right for you to be comfortable when so many people are uncomfortable. And then he'd say, and you know what, Lisa? Your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. And the only person I hear say I will and I will not as much as you is Satan. I'm like, did you just... Did you just call me Satan? Did you, did you just call your wife and the mother of your four children Satan? Did you say that to me? He's like, oh, you were like, I will, I won't. And I'm like, Satan was like, I will ascend. I will be like the most, I'm like, I want to hide. I'm not trying to go out there. And he's like, no, 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 no. You own your life. And I had to come to a place where no matter how uncomfortable it was for me to get up in front of people, that I realized that it was not about me. It was about them. I don't know what the area of brokenness is on your life that God is saying, I want to anoint it for my glory. But it is not going to be comfortable. But you will be thankful later because God loves to make you face what you fear so that you can become fearless. And he will strategically position you so that you have to face off with that. I have a beautiful granddaughter named Sophia. I think they're going to put a picture of her running topless in the snow. And yeah, okay, there it is. Okay, n none of this is appropriate. Okay, it was first snow, she's topless, she's running. Her mother sent this picture to me like, why? I have a daughter-in-law, she's like Audrey Hepburn. She's just like the personification of... Grace, she's soft-spoken, and then she gives birth to this child <laughs> that was the child my mom tried to curse me with. I hope you have a daughter just like you. And she comes in the form of my granddaughter, and I'm always just like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I don't know what to tell you. But here is Sophia, she's running, totally free, topless in the snow, no, no boundaries whatsoever. And when I look at Sophia like that, I don't look at her and say, what's wrong with you? And you know, so many of us, and I hope I can do this correctly, so many of us who love God with all of our heart, grew up in the church hearing, women are unfit, they're gullible, they're easily deceived. We also heard that we were the last to be created and the first to sin. And I'm going to be honest with you. I allowed those labels 
to stick on me. Or they might have been like on the hem of my pants. Maybe I didn't see it all the time, but I let it kind of just drift around my being. Then I had granddaughters, and I had spiritual daughters, and I realized that I would fight someone that said to them that they were unfit, that they were easily deceived, and they were gullible. And then the Holy Spirit said to me, Lisa, the labels you allow for yourself will be inherited by your daughters and your granddaughters. And he said, if you do not confront that in your own life, it will be transferred down even if it's just by the way they see you act. See, the truth is I am unfit. So Jesus made me fit. And I am an idiot, so he said, I'm going to give you the word of God so you can rightly divide. And I have been gullible in the past, and that is why he has given me the Holy Spirit to impart wisdom. And the truth is, the truth is, it doesn't matter whether you're an elder or a deacon or whatever, here's the truth. You have been sent on the Great Commission. And the Great Commission to go into all the world and make disciples is your permission. And if it is your permission, then you must not allow it to be dumbed down. You must not allow the dynamic that Peter and John had when the religious leaders called them back and said, we forbid you to preach or teach in the name of Jesus. And what did Peter and John say? You guys can continue to argue among each other whether it's right for us to obey God or obey you. But as for us, we are going to obey God. We are going to preach and we are going to teach in the name of Jesus. Because when you have been a healed woman, you cannot hold it back that Jesus is a healer. And when you have been an empowered woman, you cannot hold it back that Jesus wants to empower other women. And when you have been a freed woman, you cannot hold it back that Jesus died to have free women. I don't know what he has done on your life, but there is something on your life that this world needs to be your message. You are commissioned to go into the world and whatever your world looks like and make disciples. So I'm going to pray for you the way I pray for my kids, the way that you would want to pray for your daughters. And maybe you've never had a Sicilian grandmother pray for you before. It's a good thing I'm this far back, so I can't spit on you. But I want you to go ahead and stand to your feet right now. And I'm going to declare a couple things over you. Just lift your hands up. You are a daughter without rival. You are loved by a father without rival. Alive in this time without rival. Hailing from a nation as crazy as it seems right now without rival. Serving a God without rival. Bought by a sacrifice without rival. Entrusted with the name of Jesus. That is the name that is without rival. Empowered by the same spirit that raised Christ from the grave. The Holy Spirit without rival. Versed in the language, the word of God without rival. Part of a body without rival. Given a commission without rival. Equipped with a weapon which is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God without rival, engaged in a war. Baby girl, this is not a wedding time. This is war time, engaged in a war without rival. And before us are opportunities without rival, positioned for a harvest without rival, and destined for an eternity without rival. May you see up close what other generations only saw in the distance. May you speak out loud what other generations only dared to whisper. May you lay hold of with your hands what other generations only touched in prayer. You are for signs and wonders and miracles. You are not for death and destruction. You are not daughters of this earth or even daughters of America. You are daughters of heaven. You are daughters of eternity. You are daughters of the most high God. So be all in. Break the bonds of this earth. Lay hold of the friendship of God. Draw near to God. 
and he will draw near to you. We need you to know your purpose. We need you to find your place. We need you to have sacred space. Begin to be everything that God created you to be. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you.